Welcome to the Champs App Podcast, where we help players and parents demystify the world of minor hockey development and recruiting for both girls and boys. On today's episode, I talk with legendary Canadian hockey coach Wally Kozak. Wally shares some great stories about Haley Wickenizer and her intensity, having girls playing boys hockey, and teaching risk versus reward decision making during games. I learned a lot from this conversation, and I hope you do too. Before we get to today's amazing episode, I wanted to talk to you about the app part of Champs App. Did you know that there are over 30 NCAA coaches with Champs App profiles that you can connect with directly? These include coaches from every D1 conference. Champs App lets you create a free, beautiful online hockey resume to share with coaches, teams, and players. Your profile includes all the information coaches want to know to help decide if you are a player they want to keep on their recruiting radar. When you connect with coaches, they will receive automatic updates when you change your profile, add game or video, or alert them to upcoming games on your schedule. Just go to champs.app and click the sign up button to start your profile. You can check out the full list of the NCAA coaches using Champs app by clicking on the links in the show notes. I'm very excited to have on the podcast one of the best technical hockey coaches in the world, Wally Kozak. Originally from Macklin, Saskatchewan, and now living in Calgary, Alberta, Wally has been a career coach with roles including head scout and manager of player development for Team Canada's women's team. He has played an instrumental role in developing female hockey in Canada, thanks to more than four decades of involvement at all levels of the sport. Wally's list of accomplishments include national and international championships as a coach and numerous roles with Hockey Canada's national team program. Since leaving Hockey Canada, Wally has dedicated himself to serve the good of the game with a philosophy of developing people through sport. And he is the first guest on this podcast with a rink named after him. Welcome to the podcast, Wally. Thank you, Ray. A, an honor to have you on the program. Uh, as I just mentioned to you right before we hit record, I discovered you about seven or eight years ago when uh, my kid's hockey coach mentioned that you had a phenomenal YouTube channel and it was a great resource. And I used it with my kids several years ago, and I've been kind of tracking you ever since and very happy to have you on the podcast. Why don't we start off with kind of like we do all of our, our guests, just briefly talking about, you know, how you started playing hockey and then kind of how you got into coaching. Well, I... Started playing hockey, living in small town Saskatchewan, uh, the youngest of three boys. Um, we were, you know, first generation Canadians. Both our parents were born in the Ukraine and uh, literally escaped the Soviet Union and uh, built a life over here. And I think that generation of upbringing and adapting and to the new life in Canada. It really made me a proud Canadian over time. And sports played a big part of that in my hometown. I was actually born in Macklin, Saskatchewan, moved to Wadena, Saskatchewan, uh, where we grew up as a family. My father was a shoemaker and he uh, repaired shoes and sold shoes retail wise. He wasn't very educated, but he really took a pride in education because he didn't have a high level of education. He wanted to make sure that we did. And so education has always been an important part of my upbringing and helping keep on the right track with sports. Hockey, of course, being the primary one, but growing up in a small town, you have an opportunity to play everything. And it wasn't just sports. It was playing in the band and being in drama in high school. And uh, a small town allowed you to participate and do in that time many things. It wasn't a case of specialization at a young age. It was really a great place to grow up and a small community that really uh, played a major role in sort of guiding you through the process in a small town. Everybody knew everybody. And when it came to hockey, I really had a lot of people to grow up and admire. Uh, one of my best role models was, of course, my older brother, who was a, a very good athlete and a hockey player. And uh, my... Uh, a second brother who's older than me was a radio announcer 
but we all sort of uh, survived together in the small town and hockey, of course, in small town Saskatchewan is sort of what life's all about, especially in the winters. Yes. And so, um, so you're playing a lot of hockey growing up. Obviously you were really good. Um, how did you end up getting invited to go to um, try out for the Canadian Olympic team in Winnipeg? Well, first of all, I, I got, uh, I had an offer to go to the university of Denver, uh, on a scholarship and I had a girlfriend who I happened to marry and, and uh, live a life of 55 years with. And uh, I went to the University of Saskatchewan. I went there to play hockey. Uh, I didn't go there to get an education. I really, uh, hockey was the primary thing in my mind. And coming from small town Saskatchewan at that time as a 17 year old to a university hockey team was primarily junior hockey graduates, 20 year old men. And uh, to make that team was a major achievement. And I spent four years in the program and realizing uh, it was just a great opportunity. Like I grew up in a small town. We never had a gymnasium. We never had a weight room. At university, I discovered a little bit about exercise physiology and found a weight room and uh, started to take an interest in physical education, which I have a degree in. And I grew as a hockey player. And I was a little concerned because most of the players on our team, uh, they, they were there for their educations first and foremost. And they really weren't uh, set on becoming players and making a living at it. And I still aspired to that. So I, 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 I talked to my head coach who happened to be C. Steves, who's the grandfather of the Eves family that played in the NHL. Coach, yeah, coach, of, coach of Wisconsin as well, I believe. Yeah. Yep. And uh, he arranged to have a scout come and watch me playing at an exhibition uh, series against the University of Denver. And he got a scout from Chicago to come there. And that's where... I had a very good game playing against a pretty good hockey team. I think they won the NCAA A that year. They had Coral, Wistie, and Magnuson, names that you might not remember, but they they all played with the Blackhawks over time. And But I had a good game, got invited, signed a C form, which sort of doomed you for life to be their property. But uh, that that particular year, I did not finish my year of university. I played with a senior team in a league in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan uh, that had um, the U.S. national team and the Canadian national team in it, along with a team from, uh, from Drumheller, Alberta, prominent senior team, Edmonton and Calgary. And that year I playing against the national team. I got scouted, invited to camp. And uh, after I, I graduated, I got invited to camp and made the team. And uh, I'd gotten married the year before and we moved to Winnipeg. And that probably is the most impactful year of my life as from a coaching philosophy point of view and a purpose of playing the game with student athletes. Father Bauer wasn't the coach, but the the footprints were on the program of uh, education and, and hockey and the growth of young people. So I'm interestingly enough, I'm just proofreading a book. I just finished it up this morning uh, and it's all about Father David Bauer and his legacy and history and the ups and downs of trying to create a national team because the NHL was the be all and end all. And uh, nobody really appreciated the national program and the uh, how, how the quality of hockey that was played. But more important than that, I think the ethical nature of the way the sport was treated by all of us and by Father Barrow in particular. So that's sort of how it all fell into place. It was only one year uh, with the national team. 
because the pros eventually took the team over. They wouldn't let them come into the Olympics because they were pros. So the team disbanded for a year or two and then was recreated. And after I had played one year of professional hockey and returned to teaching, I actually came back to Calgary and got involved with Dave King and the national team program here while I taught high school and coached football, wrestling, and track. And so keeping busy, coaching was sort of my uh, passion, working with young people, students in the classroom or on any playing field. Uh, and I had a really uh, a passion for coaching. And having three daughters, of course, coaching all of them at different ages and different sports, um, it sort of led me eventually to, uh, after 20 years of teaching and being involved as an assistant with the men's national program um, up to the uh, late 90s, I I eventually took early retirement and got, off, got involved with the women's national program and happened to get employment there for about 12 years working in the national program. And the beginning years of that were uh, really got me to the 2002 Olympics, but to be on the inside of a, an elite performance program, finding out but what it takes, you know, physiologically, psychologically to be an Olympian. And all of that really uh, complementing with my teaching experience, my phys ed background, and my upbringing uh, brings a perspective to sport that uh, I, I think we often overlook. But. Gotcha. Gotcha. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, you actually coached the Japanese women's Olympic team in 98 in, in, in Nagano. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Uh, Dave King was the head coach of the national team. And actually, Father Bauer, uh, when the national team had folded, he got involved with the Japanese Federation and did programs over there. And some of his graduating players, uh, Terry O'Malley, Barry McKenzie, went over there, coached in the pro league. And then when Dave King got involved, he maintained a relationship with the Japanese, the connection of the national program. And prior to the uh, Nagano Olympics, he asked me to spend uh, time in Japan to study their hockey system to help them prepare in the course of being in and out of Japan in a four-year period, getting leaves and secondments, I had a pretty good uh, pulse of what was going on in Japan, the cultural nature of it affecting the development of players. And eventually, when Dave fin uh, finished his time with the Flames, I, I was scouting the men's team, but I got involved with the women's team, and it led me eventually to coaching the uh, women's team at the Olympics. So everything I did, uh, just a tremendous learning experience, you know, far more than I could offer, I learned, that's for sure. <laughs> Great. So um, so obviously you spent a lot of time internationally with men's programs, with women's programs. Um, you know, our audience is primarily uh, uh, related to girls hockey and moving towards the, the college game for um for, for a lot of the girls and the women. So maybe you could just talk about your experience on the differences in play, in coaching and playing between boys and girls hockey, both from a skill development standpoint and from a coaching perspective. Well, I think my first opportunity to coach female hockey, uh, I, I retired early and was asked to coach, they call it the Oval Extreme Team at the University of Calgary, which was fundamentally uh, there to develop national team prospects. Shannon Miller, who was the head coach of the University of Minnesota for years, she at the time was the assigned head coach of the national women's team. And it was a year of centralization where the players were all brought together. 
and she had created this program for young players and future prospects. So it was my first opportunity to coach female hockey. I'd coach females in individual sports, high school wrestling and um, track and field. And, and really, I recall the wrestling program dwindling when there were no young ladies involved. And the young ladies that eventually became accepted as part of the sport were able to help maintain and grow the program. So I developed an appreciation of uh, female athletes as uh, very being very competitive and not really affected by egos. They just did whatever they did to the best of their ability for the right reasons, I found. And, uh, men, I think we were always sort of comparing ourselves to others. And I think women in sports, at least I've discovered and learned more so coaching the team at the Oval and working with women over many years. They they coach, uh, they play, play the game for the right reason. They respect each other for it. And so their mindset is different. It's, uh, it complements the good of the game from my philosophy of what sport's all about. And uh, in, in team sports, it's the best players don't win, the best team wins. And that became something, came to my realization. Uh, the young female athletes listen and they learn and they want to know why. They ask questions. You, you can tell guys what to do and when to do it and how to do it. They won't question it. And in a sense, um, coaching guys has led to sort of a stifling of their growth and development. And uh, quite often it, it, it's led to a robotic kind of athlete and a person who isn't free thinking in terms of decision making. And uh, I would not go back to coaching uh, uh, male sports at, at any level. Uh, I really believe that the uh, f female athletes and young girls that play sports, uh, you can do so much more with in terms of growth and development. And um, they're just open to learning, but they want to know why they're doing things. They want the reason behind it to be valid and you can't blow smoke when you're coaching them. Gotcha. Gotcha. So one of the uh, challenges that I know uh, you're familiar with is at least at, you know, uh, at a younger age, uh, sometimes uh, coaching girls to compete has been a challenge. I know, you know, players, at least when they were starting out, uh, like Haling Wickenheiser were actually um, criticized by kind of teammates or other female players of being too competitive. How do you kind of teach them, to be more competitive and give them permission to be a driver instead of a passenger. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a story about Haley. First of all, H Haley's a, a rare breed. She is as driven and competitive as any male athlete in any sport at any level. When I took that oval team over, uh, Haley was on it and she, uh, she was a, a difficult player to coach because she was driven and nobody worked as hard as her. Nobody was as dedicated and committed to growth and learning. And she competed uh, to the point of almost isolating herself from the social environment that girls are familiar with. And uh, I, I was perplexed. So I phoned the sports psychologist uh, Cal Botterill, whose daughter Jennifer Botterill played on the team, and he actually came to the Oval as a 18-year-old to play. And I, I described, you know, the dilemma of Haley's competitiveness and her drive. And he reminded me that uh, he said she scored higher than any athlete, male or female, that was over 200 thousand athletes that had completed this test on intangible qualities of an elite athlete and she scored higher than anyone on the trait of intensity and he said to treat it as a gift 
So what I did was at practices, I was a little frustrated. She could move the puck. A game, she could move the puck. And it wasn't that she was selfish. It's just she was driven and she didn't have the broadness of vision. And I talked to her about it often. And finally, I said, Haley, I'm going to have a duck call on the bench. Uh, and when you hear me blow it during games and practices, it's a reminder that your teammates aren't decoys. They're available. They're, <laughs> they're in better positions than you. And she smiled. So the ability to use humor with her paid off. And eventually, players who were injured wanted to have the duck call in the stands. And so it's, it's something that I passed on to other coaches because in male hockey, youth male hockey, and maybe to agree in female hockey, there are some very uh, selfish. Are they driven or selfish? I don't know. Haley wasn't selfish. She was just driven. And uh, that was the biggest thing. Now, when you get to, the, you know, and I'm saying average young athletes, and I don't call Haley an average young athlete. She's an exceptional uh, athlete. But the average young female, there's a tendency to avoid contact, to be more polite. And you you have to be able to teach that by progressing, you know, building contact, confidence, stability on skates, uh, and, and going up to the point of almost teaching them how to body check, to be comfortable with body contact. And I think the interesting thing in, in the evolution of the game is that the NHL game today is more like the female game in the sense that there is really no hitting. There's body checking. But back in my day, there was, there was serious hitting. So that's the problem with the game today. It's, it's, uh, the female game has sort of found its niche. I think it's the NHL and the female games are close to one another. Minor hockey, youth hockey is still, they're trying to handle aggression and contact and body checking. And it's difficult in terms of the line between what's acceptable and not acceptable. But I, I think girls are, they're very competitive and you actually have to, do some puck race, puck protection, puck battling games and make them fun so that they learn to enjoy it and and want to compete. Awesome. That's a that's a brilliant story about uh, Haley Wickenheiser and the, and the duck call. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so when, um, uh, you know, a few years ago, we were told that, you know, play, if you're a girl, you should play with boys as long as you can, and then make the transition when you have to for whether it's college recruiting or the boys get too big, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but one of the themes that I've actually been hearing over the last uh, year or so is that some of these girls can stay with the boys too long. Um, what's your perspective on that? Well, my perspective is and when Haley played, she played boys hockey probably four years too long. Um, I would not recommend girls play boys hockey at all because it's a one-on-five game. They just carry it as far as they can, run out of options to pass, and the game possession ends. So it's really a, a very narrow focus form of playing a sport that's a team sport and if you want to become an intelligent player, and when I work with the national team as the head scout, I spent hours with parents and telling them to get there. If their daughters wanted to make the national team, well, they can get a scholarship. But if you want to make the national team, you've got to learn to play with teammates and let the puck do the work. It's not an individual sport. So playing boys hockey too long is stifling. Because girls will fall into the rut of being a, and the way they label players, you know, first, second, third, fourth line, they'll become checkers. They'll get ice time, but they won't get development. They won't learn how to play the game of hockey. 
And I'm not very impressed at all with the male game of hockey in that regard, in that uh, using your teammates, letting the puck do the work, being the, the art of passing, timely passing, support and timing. That's what the female game's all about. And that's why I like coaching it. It it sort of emulates what Father Bauer advocated with the national team. Back in that era, the NHL players, it was all about physicality, intimidation, fighting, um, hitting, not body checking, hitting, like to intimidate. And so the whole developmental process, we've, we've played... Uh, you know, the era that I played in, we thought we were the be-all and end-all of the game when, in fact, we didn't have a clue about the quality of the game that could be played. And it's being discovered in the NHL today. Yeah, absolutely. So I understand you have an expression called, uh, which goes something like, treat the puck like your cell phone. Can you, can you explain what that means? <laughs> Well, I haven't used that one for a while, but I thought of it watching uh, a, a, a U13 female game the other day because the, uh, they, they were just getting rid of the puck. They weren't confident holding on to it. And that particular story came from a, a friend of mine. He's a high school principal coaching a, a U18 girls team. And he used it with his that line with his team and the girls they identified with that they got the picture like nobody's going to touch my cell phone and it's that valuable when i coach team japan i i uh, i asked them what's the puck made of and through a translator they said rubber i said no it isn't it's made of gold treat it that way it's very valuable so possession of the puck, and you you want to, you know, when I scouted, uh, one of the, you didn't want to be the last person on your team to touch the puck. If you were, that meant you didn't protect it, you didn't keep it, you didn't maintain possession by putting it to good ice. Uh, and part of that is not being afraid, it's being confident with it. Confident your physicality, protect it, keep moving, see the ice. All those things go into that. But whatever languaging coaches can come up with, I, I use it's made of gold with the Japanese. Um, in male hockey, we we call the slot area, the, the, the net zone area that you want to protect, the bunker. And it... So the use of words, uh, I think uh, I learned this from Dave King, who coached the national team. He was just a master at uh, words that stuck, that resonated with you and became a part of your subconscious and automatically carried over to your performance. Gotcha. Okay, cool. That's uh, uh, <laughs> Those are some great expressions to, to help. Um, focus the players on on how to think about those situations. Um, related to that is, you know, when you have the puck, you have to think about risk versus reward for players, both offensively and defensively as a forward and as a, as a defender. Um, how do you teach that kind of decision-making of risk versus rewards versus just having rules on the ice? Because uh, sometimes teaching players how to, you know, apply principles versus just straight black and white rules is a little more challenging. Well, that's a, that's another thesis altogether, but really, I'm, I'm a let them play person. You know, you want to master technique, but you let the spirit prevail is what Father Bauer said. And that's so true. If you're over coaching and over breaking down and over analyzing, and over telling, they're not thinking. They're not being themselves. So the game today, and I refer to the male game, the NHL at the high, highest level, they are taking risks in all areas of the ice. 
back in our era, we had a rule. We call it the red zone in front of it, each and behind each blue line. You had to get it out, across, a whole, ahead of yours. And you had to get it inside theirs. And if you tried to be fancy with the puck, uh, high, you would turn it over. And possession, it's the game. Well, today, risk, they take risks that we couldn't take. And they do it with success. And I think the ability to let players do that and don't focus on the risk and reward because all you're thinking about is outcome. You're not thinking about development. So that particular story, I'll, I'll relate to, uh, uh, I was mentoring in Hockey, Alberta, we have a, we have six zones in the province and we have six teams and high performance coaches. We bring nine, uh, three coaches, nine coaches for each team. And I mentored nine coaches coaching one team. And at the first game we played, they were, they were skilled. I mean, but they weren't playing hockey. They never passed the puck. But they all wanted to get scouted. They wanted to get seen and look good. And with a minute left in the game, these were 15-year-olds. The defenseman on breakout decided to toe drag to beat a guy, ended up losing the puck, and they ended up tying the game. Game over. So I implemented a rule and it was really interesting that particular game. As a mentor, I, I came in the dressing room and said, I'm the head coach here. You nine coaches are, you're my assistants. And I'm putting in a rule of there will be no toe drags except below the offensive hash marks. And one of the coaches uh, challenged me on it. And of course, I explained to him they didn't know how to play hockey, that they were trying to get scouted and get attention and look good, but they had to learn to pass the puck and use each other. And I said, if it happens at practice tomorrow morning before the evening game, I'm watching. And if the coaches don't pick it out, I'm on you because that's your responsibility. And it was really uh, interesting. There was one little incident nobody caught at the practice. I watched it because I was the hawk up high. And I asked the coaches in the room after. They were all happy. It was a great practice. The puck was move, moving. And I asked, all right, who saw the toe drag? None of the coaches did. And I asked the players, all right, who did it? And the player put his hand up. I said, young man, you're aware of it. That's wonderful. That's all we want you to do is be aware of the situation. You're aware of it. We went on to go through undefeated the rest of the competition. They played hockey. So that idea of risk and reward, there's a time when you have to get them to pass and not be selfish about what they're doing for their own attention. And I think in a lot of cases, whether it's college scouts or junior scouts they look and like that and they pick that but they really don't know how to scout a player in terms of what is a complete player yep. so when i scouted with the national team and and i i draw the line that you have to be able to make a play and be a threat to score that that balance between um, knowing when and how to move the puck, but yet be one, the one that's going to take it to the net. And that's, I think, the art of coaching and selling that and getting it across to the players. Yeah, and, and teaching it is, is not, not is, like you just said, is, is a non-trivial task because yes. sometimes players get it and sometimes people don't understand. And 
uh, at least what I've seen on the girls' side, like a lot of the players can be risk averse, um, and you know they're afraid to make a mistake, um, and 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 that that's almost just as bad as you know holding on to the puck too long. Um, so it actually kind of relates to kind of my next question, which is um, you know what's your perspective on the importance of video in player development so they can see what their options were. Well, it's interesting you ask that because uh, I've always been big on visual learning. And the use of video to me is an art. And I think we overused it uh, with the national women. And Dominic Pittis, interestingly enough, coaching the American League team in Stockton, uh, he discovered that near the end of the season, they decided to do a video session on power play. And he broke them up into their all their units and the players broke down the video themselves and did a presentation back to the team on what they saw, what they had to do. And it was the best, most well-received session. So engaging the player rather than pointing out what you see, letting them dive and delve into the, the depth of video. And I know with Daryl Belfry, he did an experiment in Florida. You might be familiar with it. He had Patrick Kane, Matthews, and a couple others down there. And Patrick has been his student since he was like eight years old. And he, he asked Patrick, he said, look, we're, we're going to experiment tonight. We're, we're going out. There's a TV in this room. And, um, do you think we can look, have you talk about one of your shifts? And he did. And the detail which he, of his thinking and what he saw and what went on in his mind absolutely blew everybody away. But it also got them looking at things in a far deeper fashion. So visual learning to me is huge. And that Belfry story is something that reinforced the idea to me. And I, I suggest coaches of any team send a clip out of one of their players doing something really good. One clip only. And ask for feedback. What did you like about this highlight? Individually and as a team. And then you ask, answer the question, well, you obviously did well. What did the other team not do so well? Mm -hmm. And I would say once a month would be enough. See what they see. You know what they see. You understand where they're coming from. It's an assignment and it's not overloading. And you'll see if it gets a result. So as far as using video goes, positive clips of your own team only. And if there are mistakes made for every positive clip you've got, the other team broke down. So that's that's the approach that I suggest. That's a great technique. All right. So um, kind of moving on to kind of looking at the whole ecosystem of, of youth hockey, uh, you, you do something called the mission statement exercise. Maybe you could just talk a little bit more about how you get uh, players, parents, and coaches all on the same page, because many times, uh, especially parents, aren't on the same page as the coaches. Yeah. Well, first of all, this exercise was uh, when I was volunteering, uh, working for the uh, Hockey Canada, we created it in 1990 at the request of Hockey Canada because insurance rates were going up with hitting from behind on the guy side. And the first chapter of the goals three video, there was a goals one offensive hockey, a goals two defensive hockey, and goal three had to be respect in sport, basically checking and respect in checking. Part one of that module, 30 minute video with a brochure, was a mission statement exercise. 
Part two was fundamental sports psychology on emotional control. Because if you're running from behind and you're reacting and overreacting to situations, you can't peak, peak perform, you can't play your best. So that was introduced. And the third was just playing the danger zone near the boards, keeping your feet moving, how to take a check and showing respect when checking. And now in the NHL, it's stick on puck first. If, if you body check, you're going to lose position. So the game has changed, but nonetheless, the mission exercise has a greater need today than any time ever. Because what it does, and it was a, it was intended to be implemented in coach education programs at every level. And so basically what you do is three, uh, one simple question is everyone, parents, player, board member, they write down what they want to accomplish this season, before the season. Coaches do it and you collate them. Now, what do you want to accomplish? What would you like to do better, improve upon from last year? It's just wide open. And parents, ask your children if they don't write well or if they're too young and make sure you provide, they provide their answers, not your answers. And you sort them out into basically two columns. One column is outcomes. We, you know, and, and at the competitive level, I would start with that. Winning, winning a championship, getting a scholarship, scoring more goals. That's what they want to do. Some people will write down making new friends, uh, enjoying the experience, developing, improvement, and all those things. And I draw a line between the two columns. And now I... I, I have a third column that's blank between the two, and I call it the process column. In other words, if you want to win a championship or get a scholarship, how do you do that? And the space in the middle is the process of learning to listen, learning to work hard, take directions, and the coaches learning to teach. And it's the it's the whole idea of it's it's a process so you focus on the process not the outcomes and you write a mission statement based on outcomes and i'm just pulling this one up i think you might have seen it before yeah, That's you're, 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 you're holding up a card for the junior infernos and it's a uh, short little statement maybe you want to read it out so that folks okay. who are just listening to this can uh, can hear what it says the story of this I did this exercise with the parents at the request of the head coach, who's a friend of mine, who uh, was coaching the U13 team, and he's an older fella, um, and Cassie Campbell, who's a, sort of a, an icon, a national former player here in Canada, is coaching with him, his daughter's on the team, and his son, who is a lawyer, is coaching with him. And up to that age, U13, parents have always coached. And the parents wanted to help. He didn't need help. And they resented the fact he didn't need help. And he said, well, if somebody can't show up, I'll get you to come out. And they said, I need, they need two weeks notice. <laughs> so there was a bit of a, a rift. And that's when Tom asked me to do the exercise. And it it resulted in the, the like-minded parent group, after sorting them out, writing a mission statement based on the values in the process. And I'll read it to you. Right. Promote the pursuit of excellence through hard work, determination, integrity, ongoing skill development and friendship and no more than 15 words and that one is 15 words Perfect. and it's on a fridge magnet 
Everybody has it, puts it on their fridge. And if they're worried about what's happening, and they're losing games. It's got nothing about winning and losing in there. You learn from losing. And uh, if they read the mission statement on their fridge at home, the the naysayers or the people that are tend to create the havoc in the system, and it might be the coach who shortens the bench. He's violated the statement. It's incumbent on all members to address that issue, to be accountable for any deviation from respectful behavior. Gotcha. Simple, gotcha. simple exercise, and it works. That's beautiful. So related to that, here in the U.S., one of the challenges in girls hockey is just player density and then also coaching quality. Um, just in, in a lot of regions, you know, uh, there, there there aren't enough girls to, to make a, a really good AAA team and sometimes even the AA team. And related to that is there aren't even the best coaches to help them develop. What do you – what do you – what are your recommendations when like the coaches may not be as good and the parents aren't, don't think their kids are getting as much out of it as, as they should be in, in those situations? Well, the, the most important thing is, is being positive in the environment you're in with them. Now, I, I have a story that I tell at every coaching clinic I do uh, when I finished playing with a national men's national team in Canada for a year and playing a year of pro hockey, and I was teaching high school, coaching three sports, running a hockey school in the northeast area of our city, I got asked to coach a Bantam AA team. It was a pretty good team. The team that I was selecting came from the two teams who had been in the final the year before city final and in november i was in fourth place and frustrated and i went and talked to the coach who i said you know i'm really frustrated can i don't know what to do i'm teaching i'm planning practices i'm giving them direction they're really good kids they're working hard nothing to complain about except we weren't getting results and he said, well, Wally, I uh, I didn't know much about hockey. I had a practice, and I got hit in the head with a puck, and I asked them if they like practice. And they said no, and he said, good, I'll arrange games. He had close to 100 games that season. All he said was, I patted them on the back, cheered them on, encouraged them, and I had two expectations effort and respect and you're there to coach to grow character to build behavior and so his idea of letting them play and cheering them on versus teaching that's where the small area games come in for development they will develop more by playing in small areas and puck touches and then you will like i did by structuring what they do so that line between deliberate practice and game-like practice error on the side of game-like practice and being positive that's my advice regardless now the idea of you 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 if you combine two u13 teams they're they're approximately the same level but within each team you've got different levels but you practice with three skill groups we call it the eagles or the highly skilled of your group group and the hawks are the middle and the pigeons or the falcons would be the weak kids and you have three stations with they stay with their group and go through activities One's a teaching station, a skills station. The other is a compete station. And the final one's a game station. And if you rotate through it within your skill group, you'll make more progress. And you finish up with cross-ice games within your skill group. So everybody gets puck touches. 
So we think we need to teach and tell. No. They, there's a lot of players that just got better by playing. Right, right. All right, last question for you. So the one thing I've been really impressed with you about is that you're always learning. Um, even though you have decades of experience, uh, it's pretty impressive that you're still going out there talking to other coaches and trying to learn from them and trying to share your knowledge with other folks on top of learning from them. What advice do you have for players, um, especially girls, on how to learn how to learn? Um, and, and always having a mindset of getting better. Well, I, I, I really think young people, not just girls, they have an appetite for learning. They have curiosity. And their exposure and opportunity to learn is far greater than ours because of their exposure with the technology of the times. They can access any drill, any skill any concept you can educate yourself through the use of technical resources and watching things and i i really believe the fault in coaching can be over directing them so the line between sort of letting them grow and learn so you want to go as a coach. This is really important. I grew up in an era of yelling and telling. But learn to ask. What works for you? What do you think of this? What would you do differently? Ask them questions. And that's sort of, it, it's something we're not accustomed to. And I, th I think that even parenting is the same thing we tell we have rules we have guidelines and the females in particular want to know the why of those guidelines yeah absolutely. and that's it's that simple it's almost uh we're trying to as adults we're trying to deal with things that they were dealt with in our time and i think we've got a lot of catching up to do and uh, like Daryl Belfry said, the student is the teacher, not us. Gotcha. Yes, absolutely. So, Wally, I really want to thank you for coming on the Champs App podcast. It was great to hear the, the Haley Wickenheiser story, hear about all your different expressions uh, that, that make it easier for, for players to understand uh, different concepts, and obviously your philosophies on development uh, that, that you've shared uh, quite, quite eloquently uh, during, during our conversation. So thank you much for doing this. Thank you very much. I really want to thank Wally for coming on the podcast. It was an honor to have him join me. I enjoyed hearing all of his different hockey expressions that help players learn new concepts, how to use video in development, and his mission statement exercise. You can check out all of Wally's YouTube training and coaching videos in the show notes. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Before you go, I wanted to share more about the app in Chance app. If you've listened to this podcast before, you know I spend a lot of time talking with coaches, parents, and players about the hockey recruiting process. One of the key questions that people want to know is, how does a player get noticed by college coaches? While there are many ways to be discovered, the easiest way to get on a college's radar is to send a coach an email and provide them all the information they need to assess if you are a player worth keeping their eyes on. That's where the app part of Champs app comes in. Champs app was designed based on all the conversations and feedback we've received about the recruiting process, and we've built a tool to help players and coaches connect with a ton of the information they want to know. It all starts with creating a free, beautiful Champs app profile. After that, there are some pretty magical things that can happen to help make the recruiting process a little less overwhelming. Your Champs app profile includes all the basic academic, personal, and athletic information coaches want to know. Then, by including video, schedule information, and your coach's contact details, colleges can easily start their evaluation process. You just copy and paste your personalized link and send it to coaches so they can see your public player profile without even having to log in or create a Champs app account. Or you can connect directly with coaches on Champs app. More and more coaches are creating their own Champs app profiles and connecting with players themselves every day. Now coaches can have all the information they need to assess where you might fit in their recruiting plans. Even better, college coaches can track your progress throughout the winter and showcase seasons. 
because as you make changes to your profile, coaches will get notified to your updates. And in the future, we will be adding even more amazing features to improve your visibility to the recruiting process and hopefully increase your odds of success. If you wanna see what a player or coach profile looks like before you start your own, look in the show notes to see some examples. My kids and I have used Champs app for their recruiting process. In fact, my son was invited to a AAA tryout thanks to his Champs app profile. So go to www.champs.app and start your player or coach profile. It only takes about 15 to 20 minutes to complete most of your key information. Good luck, and please let us know how it helped with your recruiting journey.